Henschker, and uh, I am running the, the Siegel Center. It's a, a nice sunny day here in Manhattan uh, today, and uh, and we are still in the middle of uh, uh, a reality that seems so much stranger than fiction. The corona numbers are up. Uh, tumult in the White House was rejecting of election results and meetings this morning um, um, in the White House that so many of us think they're unconstitutional and we're real jeopardy to democracy. But in this uh, turbulent time, um, we do need to talk about also what we think is essential, what's important, even so society tells us theater is not essential. Uh, we believe it is, art is important, it's significant, and the voices of the artists um, are uh, what we perhaps have to listen to even closer now um, than ever. We at the Siegel Center always thought that next to the directors or the playwrights, also mm -hmm. the voices of the dramaturgs, the producers, the curators are of equal importance. It's a collective work in theater. We are understanding that more and more like a sports team, there might be the ones who do the goals and uh, or cap, keep the penalty kicks, but it's a team effort. And um, in this idea of the expanded uh, understanding of theater, of dramaturgy. Um, we have with us here a great thinker and also worker in the field, in the vineyards um, of theater, as my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Peter Eckersall, uh, uh, one of the leading uh, thinkers in, in theater and uh, also a great, uh, great teacher. Here at the Siegel Talk since March, we talked to theater artists and uh, to get, capture the moment, archive the moment. Um, of this a time of Corona, what is changing, what perhaps already has changed. And after a little break in September, we went back to think about themes like uh, Theatre of the Real, which we had a series with Carol Martin, where we will have a second week. And now this week we focused on dramaturgy. We had the uh, inspiring Sebastian Kaiser from the Volksbühne Berlin, who talked about to about us what it meant to have that great theatre after the opening of the wall, the, work of Frank Castor, what it meant to the city, how much it was part of a reinvention of a city that had focused energy and attention and also understood that uh, next to plays that also part of a transformation are activities, uh, discussions, thought, uh, people occupying a theater with their feet uh, around uh, uh, the, the clock and uh, how much that has changed and also represented something new after also an event that is as significant as the shutdown here, it was the opening um, of the wall. In a way, we, we see ourselves uh, in the work of the great Svet, uh, Svetlana uh, Alexievich, who created this great body of work of interviews. She said, uh, perhaps it's not a moment also to create fiction or a theory. Uh, she recorded testimonies of witnesses and participants in the history and uh, in, in great, great work at the end of the Red Yeoman, the Red Man, the Red Person, and the Holocaust um, Diaries. And the same, I think, we are doing here. We really are creating um, a, an archive, a monument to the, uh, the courage, but also the suffering and the thoughts the field um, is going through. Um, yesterday, we had N. Catania and Sidney Mahone, who were talking about the time in the 80s uh, when dramaturgy took hold for the first time in, uh, in the Americas when it became a significant part of it. It's still not as much in the center as it is in Europe, but it is beginning of, was the beginning of the change. And Anne, who was still um, at the Lincoln Center Theater in Sydney, who was the best theater, uh, Horizon Theater in New Brunswick, who really made a tremendous pioneering contribution. The founders, she were co-founders of Lambda, the Association of Dramaturgs, I'm sure some are listening today. And so today in that journey, in this multifaceted journey of dramaturgy, we are now coming to Peter Eckersall, who uh, represents um, uh, international, European, Asian way of thinking. He, let me tell you a few words about him. He is uh, a teacher or professor, uh, we say, but uh, he is as a teacher uh, of the PhD program in theater and performance at the Graduate Center CUNY, the City University of New York, where this dramaturgy also is in the center uh, of, of his uh, teachings. And he's a, a fellow at the University of Melbourne. His publications include Machine Made Silence with Christoph van Baal in 2020, just this year, The Rutledge Companion to Theatre and Politics uh, with Helena Graham. New Media Dramaturgy, which he co-authored with Helena Graham again at Shear, and a Pop-Up Performativity and Events 
in the 60s. Japan also work he is most known for is an Asian theater specialist, Japanese theater specialist, and, uh, uh, and uh, very deep insights into dramaturgy. And he has worked a lot. He was also running a company, a co-founder of a respected, highly respected Australian company. The name was Not Yet, It's Difficult. And um, so he was a practitioner for, uh, I think, almost a decade. And uh, also he worked as a dramaturg for pieces that appeared in La Mama and in the Riga Biennial pieces. So, uh, Peter, uh, welcome. And I hope you forgive me my long introduction. We always say it's about listening and then I go on and on. But I think it is important to have some context. Uh, where are you at the moment? Thanks, Frank. Um, well, I'm in New York in my apartment uh, where I've been since March. Um, pretty much um, just, you know, being located in a very tiny part of the city and navigating that part of the city every day in my walks and in my work. So, um, you know, it's a kind of thing, a dramaturgy of smallness, um, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. so, but it, as you said, it's a nice day here. So it's a very nice time of the year in New York. Yeah, you like Marvin Carlson. You two are uh, people who normally travel around, go around, see things. How does it feel to be in a small enclosed space? Well, um, it's a. I mean, it. In some ways, it's. In some ways, I guess it's a relief not to be traveling so much, and um, because we're always aware of the impact on the environment of that, but also on our on our time and on our on our work because we have to keep up our teaching and our um, research and so you know in some ways it's it, once one stops one sort of sees a different uh, sense of space and time which i think is is good to experience again um, um but i must say also it's been challenging to run a program and um, work with people in classrooms and on their projects at this time because it's not just my work that stopped, it's a, a lot of theatre work that stopped and it's a lot of um, the research that students are doing in their PhDs that stopped. And so we're, you know, we're, I think after a long time now, we're, we're pretty much, you know, a moment of waiting for, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a perverse time because it, we, we have probably some of the highest rates of infection in the country now. Um, uh, of, of any time during the pandemic. And yet at the same time, it feels like uh, people are waiting for the vaccines to arrive and for some sense of there being a, a, a time after the end of the pandemic. So um, time stretched, I guess, in that way. So um, we, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's interesting time to contemplate that kind of, uh, that kind of thinking perhaps. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's quite uh, something and uh, we all deal differently uh, with it. We, we read, we listen, uh, um, pe people dance in their apartments every evening. Some people write. <laughs> Anjo, who was here yesterday, she's working on a Kleist book. You decided to use this time next to your ongoing project to hmm. focus on dramaturgy. Tell yeah. us why and what is the book about? Well, you know, essentially we, we have a a long summer break where normally we would be going to conferences or, or doing, you know, I do a lot of uh, international research projects and artistic projects and they're all put on hold. And for a long time now, I've been wanting to work on a book on dramaturgy uh, that I think, you know, I was thinking a lot about the way in which performance, contemporary performance had really changed its relationship to text that was dealing with new, um, political issues and new trends within society and culture and thinking about the way in which performance itself had adapted and responded to, you know, not so much representing these kind of activities in a, in a didactic or Brechtian sense, but, but as you said in your introduction, uh, you know, a moment where these things are being recorded and documented. So there is an extension here from the, the topic of last week and the kind of so-called theater of the real or documentary theater in that I'm, I was thinking a lot about th that trend in performance after post-traumatic theater where um, playwrights are uh, sometimes dealing with a, a sense of crisis in the form. They're no longer trusting the words that they use. Um, they're no longer trusting the impact of poetry or of no longer trusting the 
the, the idea of a, a kind of classical notion of representation and moving into a more uh, interdisciplinary and hybrid performance framework that often includes moments of the play form transforming into something else. So something that might include some kind of visual arts uh, references. So moving from theater into performance with an installation component or uh, mixing the performance of, um, of a drama with, with some of our, our understanding of how dance is contributed to the work. And then parallel to this is, is, the, is the great rise of interest in performance in visual arts context. So I was thinking about how do we try and theorize that and try and account for that uh, in a book form. And I began with the idea of, of the theater of image in some respects, the, the way in which uh, playwrights were typically not, and now here I'm talking about you know, a certain trend in theater. I'm not necessarily talking about um, that continuing project of mainstream theater where essentially theater hasn't changed for a long time. Um, and I'm not particularly concerned about that. I'm not really concerned in the book about whether that kind of theater should change or not. That's not my argument. Um, my argument is about the way in which this contemporary performance world is developing new vocabularies of performance that are taking us to uh, a different understanding of what performance is and what it does and how it communicates its, its meanings to audiences. So um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a short text for the 100th issue of the um, journal Performance Research, um, uh, where I was asked to write a short text on uh, dramaturgy. Um, that was a project that uh, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, editor of performance research, Richard Goff, commissioned 99 essays, each on uh, a single word or key word of each of the 99 previous themes of those uh, issues of the journal. So anybody who knows performance research knows that it has um, it's a theme based journal that has a, a key word, usually um, uh, after the word on, so on politics or on climate or on dramaturgy. And I was given the task to write an essay on dramaturgy. And um, I started to think about the way in which, you know, after Bertolt Brecht, dramaturgy was really a, a practice of making things visible, was making things in the political world, in the social world, in the cultural world, visible in a way that was opening it up to some kind of inquiry from an audience. And then mapping onto that, the, 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 my interest in visuality and media and um, non-text-based performance. Um, so this concept of making visible is both, a, um, uh, I guess, an older, more established understanding of what dramaturgy does in the theatre. That is, a, you know, an understanding of, of, of a Brechtian dramaturgy with uh, a more contemporary um, setting for dramaturgy, which is um, thinking about the, the challenge of thinking about the dramaturgy of sound or vision or music or presence or smoke or atmosphere, um, very much a, a, a so-called new dramaturgy approach. And so I, I wrote that as a short text. And then when I was uh, over the summer this year, I was thinking that I should use this time productively and, and um, try and put down these thoughts for a book. And so I wrote a book proposal and I came back to the essay, The Dramaturgy to Make Visible and um, put it together with my interest in um, the presentation of, of themes, political themes, cultural themes in contemporary theatre. And um, so the, the book is Proposals, Dramaturgy to Make Visible, Remaking Politics in Contemporary Performance. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's, you know, I'm started writing this book now and I'm hoping to write the book over the next 12 months. So I'm really making a very concerted effort to start a, a, a writing practice that I'll try and do every day at the beginning of the day before I do my other work. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess one of the interesting things for me is that this, 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 this is, a way in which I can reflect on some of the 
disparate parts of my work, both as a dramaturg and as, a, as an academic. I've worked in both fields for a very long time now. And as you mentioned, I, you know, I come from Australia. I was a performance maker in Australia with NYID and with other companies and working as a dramaturg with, with artists as a freelance dramaturg, always in uh, a field of what I would call performance dramaturgy rather than um, working with playwrights. That's um, an expertise that um, uh, people like Anne Katten, uh, you know, your speaker yesterday have or other um, text-based dramaturgs, I guess. But um, I grew up in the performance dramaturgy tradition um, and I wanted to write about that, not only in terms of uh, my connections to Australian work, but also, you know, a lot of our work has been in Asia. Um, again, combining my academic expertise on Japanese theatre, I did a PhD in the Department of Japanese Studies, uh, wrote about the 60s in Japan and its relationship to theatre and have worked on contemporary performance as a research uh, researcher ever since. And, done a lot of projects in the region too. Um, so I was wanting to bring that kind of um, understanding of dramaturgy um, that is perhaps not this centrally focused on the US or the UK or the European contexts and thinking about how dramaturgy is, is working in the world, across the world in different locations. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I feel it's about that on the dramaturgy of dramaturgy. Yeah. You, you are right and your research is about the construction of work, the presentation of work, the reception of work. Mm. And, and you, 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 you have that term of the, of the transformation in, mm. um, in, in the 60s. So maybe tell us a bit uh, about that idea. Well, to me, the, the, the important thing about dramaturgy and the reason why I think it is, you know, why, why I work in that field and and why I think it's important to theatre is that it really makes us um, focus on the question of what happens when we translate an idea into practice. So there's a transformation from uh, a kind of theoretical, cultural, political world into some kind of artistic representation, artistic production, or maybe even some presentation. And so how do we take ideas that are, you know, hugely important, um, ideas that address really some of the enduring and important problems of our time um, that are usually discussed in, in other fields, in science or in the humanities. And yet, you know, we now have an understanding that artistic practice is also an important way of addressing these ideas. And dramaturgy for me is a way of thinking about that transformational process uh, from uh, the kind of research that one does from the kind of political perspectives or cultural perspectives and um, voices that we want to, you know, the things that we want to say in, in, uh, in, in and through our artistic practice. Um, but, you know, dramaturgy charts the process of, of getting from A to B in a sense, from the idea, its conception into some embodied um, spatialized um, uh, dramaturgical representation or presentation on the stage or in, 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 indeed or in, in some public forum. Um, and the crucial thing is that dramaturgy for me, and, and you know, this reflects my training in the contemporary performance world of dramaturgy, it makes that conversation visible. So it doesn't hide the kind of explicit uh, use of um, techniques or strategies or artistic uh, creations. Um, uh, to present those ideas, it makes them visible as a part of the creative process. So when we then go and watch a work, we, we engage in a conversation about our response to the work and our feelings about the work, but also we can see the construction of the work in a certain kind of way. We can see the way, we can see the artist's thinking um, in the way that the work is signaling to, to um, that thinking uh, through the visibility of the form, through the visibility of the conversation about the form. So naturalistic theatre typically 
um, historically hides its um, its form and naturalizes it and, and uh, pretends that the form is you know that we're simply just watching something that is happening in the world. Um, whereas I think this uh, this other end of the spectrum makes the form itself very visible and part of the conversation of the, of the work itself. That is inherently dramaturgical. So. Um, um, that's you know very much where I'm coming from in in relation to thinking about that question of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if we go back to the '60s, I think we're talking about a, a historical era that thought about these kinds of forms differently to the way we think about them now. Um, you know, it's an interesting um, exercise to think about going into the time machine and going back and perhaps seeing some of these iconic performances from the 1960s that you know we have some record of through video or film or uh, photography or um, people's diaries and so on um, but they you know they were very much premised on a different understanding of transformation they were very much premised on a different understanding of, of the politics of dramaturgy um, and in many cases around the world, we had this moment of, of eruption of, um, of a thinking about the politics of experience, of a thinking about sensation as being political, as a connecting almost symbolically of the kind of presence of bodies on the street in these kind of uh, you know, evolving protest movements that were really a, a kind of moment in the 60s and the kind of highly explicit uh, presentation of bodies in the theater. And there's points of commonality between what was going on in Japan and say New York at that time, but there's also quite specific differences. And you could say that largely, I think it's a theater of bodies in the sixties that is being kind of explored here. And, and by that, I mean, it's the body as an expressive political medium, not just as a kind of aesthetic medium, um, and um, you know, it's it's a it's it's a it's a very contrasting time to now, I think, because um, you know the way that performance has evolved since that time, and the way that politics have evolved in, since that time, uh, have meant that we now relate to the body differently. We relate to the text differently. We relate to the understanding of what a radical politics might be differently, because you know the times demand something new. Mm -hmm. As you as you so rightly say, yeah. Um, you, hmm. you, you quote uh, Marianne von Kerkhoven as one of your main witnesses, perhaps next to Brecht. She's not so well known. Why yeah. is she, why is she central? What did she tell us? Hmm. Well, so when I started work as a dramaturg, in a, in in essentially, I started drama work as a dramaturg without really knowing what a dramaturg was. There was no training of dramaturgs. This is uh, when we founded our company. Not yet, it's difficult. And we knew that we wanted to do something that was research-based and um, that was um, not play-based as a form, but something that drew on plays as one of the texts in the kind of production of a new kind of work. We knew that we wanted to work with some of our training that we'd experienced as a company through our connections to uh, colleagues in Asia. So this was a political move for us. We were, um, you know, we were, of a generation who decided that we didn't need to go to London or New York to learn how to be theatre artists. Uh, instead, we were very much committed to the idea of working in a region. And, and also, you know, as in reference to our own culture that was dramatically transforming in, in relation to questions of immigration and diversity. So Australia is, a, is, you know, to a large, not to a whole degree, I mean, it has a British heritage and indigenous heritage, but uh, it's, it's also quite mobile in its Asian-ness, I would say. Um, so, but, the, the, you know, we didn't really know what, what a dramaturg was, so we kind of made it up as we went along. But then I was introduced to Marianne van Kirkhoven, who is a dramaturg, and, or was a dramaturg, one of the great dramaturgs of the French or Flemish, the Flemish New Wave. And um, Marianne was a, a pioneering figure in European new dramaturgy. She was the person who coined the term new dramaturgy. And 
a part of that was was her relationship to back to the 60s. She was, um, uh, as she always said, uh, 68 generation. She was part of a group of artists in, in Europe and also a part of philosophers and scholars who experienced, I guess, the possibilities of the 60s and then also the collapse of those possibilities. So when people refer to 68, they're always referring to a kind of moment of crisis, a moment when you know, what was a possible way forward for a political movement was no longer possible. Um, so that, I think, haunted that generation of not just theatre artists, but also philosophers. And we can think of Deleuze and Guattari as 68 generation. We can think of um, um, many um, uh, people from uh, field, uh, artistic fields and philosophical and political fields as trying to think through in a way, what, what was the possibility for politics now after 68? Um, and by 68, we're talking broadly a, a latitude of years from 68 to 72 maybe. And it includes signature events such as the, the end of the Paris 68 revolution, um, the, the rise of uh, ultra leftist uh, political organizations like the Red Brigade and, and the Beta Meinhof and, and their eventual collapse, the, 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 the ridiculous pretentious suicide of Mishima, um, you know, where he, you know, from the right wing tried to lead a, a military coup in Japan. Um, all of these kind of events, uh, and, and of course, the, the end of the Vietnam War, and the, um, uh, and the sense that what was promised was not quite realized. So Marianne, um, taking that thinking into her, her theatre practice, also became a dramaturg. Um, and she was one of the, the founders of uh, 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 the Kai Theatre in Brussels, which was founded in the 1980s as a theatre where there were a lot of interdisciplinary practitioners. So what went on to become the very famous Belgian new or Flemish new wave began in those times with a group of artists that included people like Jan Fabre, um, Marianne, um, those, um, uh, Anna Th and Teresa de Kiersmarke, um, and a little bit after that uh, company, Cédula Labay and so on and so on. So you have this conversation between theatre and dance, this theatre and visual arts, this conversation between theatre and philosophy and theatre and politics. And so Marianne's idea was that this, you know, this is a new kind of theatre, it needs a new kind of dramaturgy. And so in a series of texts that she published in the 1980s, uh, she started to theorize this um, idea of a new kind of dramaturgy. And on, on the one hand, she always said it was a dramaturgy that was about learning to handle complexity. And that was a complexity of aesthetic um, conditions, but it was also a complexity of politics for her. So, you know, things were no longer to be seen in, in diametrically opposed terms or in terms that were simply black and white, but there was a complexity and a, and a kind of movement of, of politics that was uh, in, in motion and in flow. And the theatre, the performance world needed to engage with that idea much more than it had done in the past. She also proposed a dramaturgy of... Um, uh, you know, she wrote a text where she said, you know, is there a dramaturg, what is the dramaturgy of light? What is the dramaturgy of uh, space and design? What is the dramaturgy of um, an actor? So she gave us a proposition for dramaturgy that was no longer simply concerned with story arcs or constructions of the play script or uh, a kind of narrative practice or a um, storytelling practice, if you want to call it that. It was concerned about form, and about the way in which form itself was also structural. And it became a medium through which you could create a new kind of performance, a medium that you could have these conversations between forms and you could start to explore the experiences of life differently and present those experiences to audiences in different ways and therefore give rise to new um, conversations about society, culture, politics, and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you think that perhaps this is one of the changes that instead of simplifying the world that we understand it in the Russian fable, for example, that the ambiguity, that the uh, complexity uh, actually is 
what it is all about to reflect how life, what's real, how life really is, how yeah. what meaning really yeah. represents. I th well, I think this is crucial, and I think it's a, a it's her major political contribution in a way, or artistic contribution as well. But you know, you know, in a world that is is being surrounded in the you know by the turn of the twenty first century, uh, where politics have become banal in a certain kind of sense, where um, media and um, and especially the rise of right wing politics, but also left wing politics have become much more hardened in their perspectives on what is good and bad, what is acceptable and not, and where you have the rise of um, a kind of an, a, a new form of authoritarianism that we're living through in our time. The response always has to be complexity. The always response always has to be things are never that simple. Let's let's think through the complexities of this and allow for the complexities of this. Let's develop uh, artistic and 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 uh, uh, models, but also thinking models, ways of thinking that that enable us to think uh, about the complexity of things and to think in a way that is much more inclusive as a result. Um, and then when you come at the other end of that, you start to see a new role for theatre, because if theatre is to embrace complexity, well, then it has to be something that engages in different forms, multi-forms. It has to do different things. Theatres themselves are no longer just sites for the presentation of the latest season or the, you know, the latest new play by a, a star playwright or the presentation of the new performance with the star actor. Um, they are places for the debate and exchange of ideas. And so you have, um, you know, uh, people turning theatres into universities or um, uh, theatre suddenly starts to operate in a, in, a, in a much more rich and diverse and, and complex terrain. And so I think that complexity is, is not, should never be seen as a criticism. It should be seen as a virtue. Mm -hmm. What are places or what are artists you think they represent that that idea? Well, you know, we we do, you know, we do use the shorthand contemporary performance to describe this kind of work. And that's, I mean, in a way, it's it's not helpful because contemporary performance is such a vague term that it could be possibly anything. Um, but it is a term that I think has meaning to artists in, in different places around the work, around the world, who are drawn to, uh, again, we come back to the question of what dramaturgy is, who are drawn to dramaturgical strategies that make visible their understanding of theatre as a site of um, uh, information, knowledge, activism, rupture and perhaps you know to use Chantal Mouffe's term agonism so theatre that is resisting in, in that way we can come back to Sebastian Kaiser's uh, conversation you know for him I think I, I don't want to mean to speak on behalf of him but you know that theatre that Volksbühne that and his work is always on the side of resisting it's always on the side of critical um, response it's always on the side of looking at the at, at, at things in a more complex way. Um, so you can think of artists who are doing that across the globe, who I think are, uh, now, you know, we could say that playwrights are also doing this. And my, my argument is never with playwrights. It's just that I'm talking about a different, I'm talking about contemporary performance. Um, there are, you know, really remarkable plays that address complex themes and ideas and issues and, teach us something about the state of the world. Um, but I think what defines these practices is, is, their, is their openness to interdisciplinarity. They're very often collaborative works. They're produced out of a, a sense of artistic collaboration. Um, they're very often produced out of a different relationship to audience. Um, and they're very often produced with a dramaturg in the room. <laughs> um, uh, uh, who, who has a, a, perhaps a more active role, not just as a person who's a kind of show doctor, but somebody who is 
present to curate a series of engagements with the themes and issues so that that can have influence on the work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, you talk about uh, artists like Toshiki Okada, uh, mm -hmm. Christopher Donk in Belgium, yeah. Uh, yeah. Meyer on the Shell Bruno, I turned around to yeah. um, Why, what do they stand for in their work? Uh, well, I mean, here we're, this is very much what I'm going to write about in the book. It's, you know, it's, it's obviously something that I'm interpreting. Um, th these are all great artists who, uh, I think their work speaks to what they stand for. Um, uh, and they all make, um, they're all very good at talking about their work too and, and, and making statements about that. But so my response is an engagement with what they're doing or what I think they're doing. Okada, for example, I think is really interesting because uh, a contemporary Japanese playwright and director who began uh, working as a young uh, artist in the late 1990s, but really grew up in the 21st century and has written two or three, I think of, um, the, well, I'm, I'm biased because I'm a Japanese theater specialist, but two or three of the most important plays of the 21st century, shall we say. Um, now, his work is phenomenally interesting because first of all, one of his primary orientations is Brecht. Uh, he's acknowledged that, you know, when he was a young man, he, he came across the writings on Brecht. He was, a, he was actually studying business or econo ec economy, economy at university. And he initially thought he might be a filmmaker, but then he ended up in theatre after reading uh, Brecht's work and also reading text by um, Hidata Oizawa, um, the very well-known playwright and director who is famous for inventing the um, uh, Gendai Kogo Engeki or the colloquial theatre of Japan. You know, this, uh, the critics have dubbed this quiet theatre. Now, people are probably familiar with Hirata's work because it's been produced in international forums very often. Most recently, his work has been the, the famous robot plays where he's produced plays with humans and non-humans on the stage and robots um, performing in a, in a very realistic kind of theater, quote unquote. Okada is the next generation on, somebody who has an interest in everyday life and, and the experience of everyday people. But his early work was very much about the subcultural uh, people in, living in Japan after the end of the bubble economy. So living in a time of precarity, living in a time when, um, you know, living in a kind of malaise of, uh, of the 21st century, which, and, and here we, you know, I'm, I, I think we have to be very careful about distinguishing the differences of people's lives around the globe. But many people in, in uh, so advanced um, postmodern economies or neoliberal economies, experience a certain kind of comfort in the discomfort of it. You know, there's a sense that they can't move forward, they can't move back, but they're not. They're not in. You know, this is precarity rather than uh, extreme deprivation. Um, and there's something about that experience that is very it's an alien it's actually an, it's an experience of alienation but an experience that is uh, of alienation that is very different to the way we would have thought about it in uh, Marxist terms or in Brechtian terms where the alienation was always in relation to something else I'm alienated from my work I'm alienated from my parents I'm alienated from what you know whatever mm -hmm. um, or Cutter's work really sees us all alienated in all the time, but the object of, of what we're alienated from is not so clear. Um, we're simply in a world that is kind of stuck. Um, we're in a world that is um, a, a certain kind of uh, quiet authoritarian politics. <laughs> um, um, and I think he depicts these states very well. His signature and, and remarkable groundbreaking play was um, a work called Five Days in March, written in 2003, um, in which two young hipsters from Shibuya, speaking very subcultural Japanese language, very hard to understand, uh, unless you were part of that milieu, uh, um, 
go to a love hotel, a, a pay by the hour um, hotel. It, it's a kind of East Asian thing where there's little privacy in those cultures. So young people often um, go to a hotel that is specifically for having sex. And, um, and they go, they spend five days in the love hotel in a kind of sex marathon. And it's the same five days as the outbreak of the Gulf War. Um, and, you know, so the play draws us into a kind of set of circles, you know, concentric circles about um, disaffected youth, about this kind of ambient um, durational sexuality that is ultimately lacking any kind of emotional intensity. Um, uh, it's certainly the play is obsessed with naming locations and places. So it's dealing with the kind of transformation of the urban world of, of Shibuya. Uh, it's, it's cool, it's got a cool factor in that these are hipster young people. And then it's referencing the fact that we have this um, concentric circle of the, uh, the, the post-war situation of Japan where because of the American authored post-war constitution, Japan has to foregone the right to declare war and yet has to be in this war, in this coalition of the willing uh, way back in this is the Bush era. Um, uh, but, you know, they're there in the Middle East, but they're not allowed to shoot anybody. <laughs> so um, the play puts together these kind of concentric circles of the personal and the, the national and the global and, and really gives us a sense of this being not just a particular condition, but a kind of a kind of endless moment of um, um, and you know he's he's a playwright and director, and so there's a very pioneering use of the physicality of the actors in his technique of staging his, his this play and his many other plays that is disrupting the text and and changing our understanding of what it means to hear a story, and the story becomes very fragmented and we have a, a kind of um, contrast between the, the 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 level of the of the of the story that's being narrated and the physicality of the bodies, and you know, creating these very ambient um, qualities of disturbance. And so, moving forward, that question of creating ambient qualities of disturbance, I find really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Because it's not like, you know, when we go into the streets and, and I mean, if in some places you do, if you're living in Hong Kong or um, in, in Brazil or in the Philippines, you know, the, the visibility of authoritarianism is, 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 is there, you know. Yeah, but, know, the repetition of history, the yeah. uh, references, you know, to the famous, yeah. famous film. And I think, I mean, you also talk about it and I think also what about the idea of the atmosphere, right? What? Yeah, so. It's, I, I'm fascinated with this idea of um, the presence of atmosphere and performance, and it's become almost a, a way of communicating something that, you know, is beyond communication. So, you know, if we're talking about cataclysmic events, they're very often beyond representation. There's this question of how do we represent something as traumatic as the Fukushima um, disaster or... Um, you know, as the, but, you know, we're not just talking about the magnitude of large events, but also small events. You know, what is, what is, what do we gain from simply just sort of translating them into a kind of narrative based story of that event? Um, you know, the question is, well, perhaps not much. Um, we have to create these because very often the intensity of these events is communicated not through uh, the kind of narrative structures, but through the feelingness of them, through the ways in which we are aware of things that uh, are slightly beyond our comprehension or apprehension, shall we say. And yet they are the kind of dark forces that are, that are coming into our world. Um, the atmosphere of authoritarianism in politics, the darkness of that kind of experience and what it feels like to be living in a society that is in that stage of existence. Alternatively, the atmosphere of a kind of, you know, endless kind of consumption of, you know, the sensationalism and emptiness of that. Um, these are things that we can uh, write about or, you know, and speak about, but in order to convey 
the, the, the sensibility of it, what it, how it feels in the body. Well, then I think we're seeing artists use these techniques of um, atmospheric production much more than, than in the past. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the way in which Okada's work transforms literally out of a play frame into some kind of other experience of, of it's a performance, but it's 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 the 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 texture and the 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 structure of the play is broken down, and it's transformed into something that we feel, and we respond to with a series of questions about that. Um, in New York, Richard Maxwell has has done several works that have been extremely uncanny in the way that they resolve or, or don't resolve. And I think that that's another really good example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Um, um, uh, Chris Verdonk, you mentioned, well, Chris is, a, is, is you know, he's never worked in realist theatre. He's a, he's a performance maker with a, a strong connection to visual arts practice. And, you know, he has many uncanny objects on his stage performing um, performing in a way that is communicating a, a real sense of crisis about the existence of the planet. You know, his work is very strongly connected to themes of the end, you know, the, this kind of moment of necro-capitalism where capitalism is, is eating the very sustainability of the planet. Um, it's eating itself and it's going to take us with it. Um, and I think Chris's work is trying to explain or give us a sense of the, you know, of, of the fact that that is what's happening. Um, and so, you know, if you want to talk about the unrepresentability of, of, of something, well, then you talk about th this, um, this kind of excessive necro-capitalist event that is taking place in our world now. Mm -hmm. um, you can't encapsulate it in a single play, but you can express some sensibilities of loss and of transformation and of and of passing and of and of apocalypse um, you worked with him also as a dramaturg so how is his approach to these kind of doom or this apocalyptic thinking <laughs> he works on kafka or other how does he how does he do it as a theater of well theater? how does he approach a work a i i i work with chris as a as a scholar of his work, I'm not formally his dramaturg. That that honor goes to originally Marianne van Kirkhoven, um, but now Christophe van Baal, a younger dramaturg working in Brussels in, in in Belgium. But you know, we I do have a lot of uh, connection to that practice, and so I do have an understanding. Ironically, Chris always begins with a close reading of the text, and the text is the departure point for performances, which very often when you see the performances, there's no text left, but there is a process of taking the kind of sensibility of that text into the, into the ultimate outcome or production. So as you said, Chris's work is very concerned with a, a concentration of authors around the mid 20th century, uh, Kafka, Beckett, um, uh, Daniel Himes, the Russian surrealist poet, um, but also um, another um, point of reference for Chris is always J.G. Ballard, uh, the science fiction writer. Um, and I mean, what what defines these texts, I think, in many respects, is this sense of um, uh, identifying the the crisis of living, um, uh, the difficulty of living, the 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 forces that are aligned against one living the, the um but also the sense of just living in living living in that moment you know in a kind of classic beckettian sense um you know nobody dies nobody does anything no we're just, they just live in this kind of endless um present of um uh of 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 the horror of living <laughs> um and so Typically, Chris begins with a text. Um, uh, recently, he's also been very concerned with no plays, and that's where I have done a lot more work with Chris, uh, taking the because a no play is by definition a ghost play. A so Japanese no play, yeah. Yeah, a Japanese no play. So a well, no play is always a play in which ghosts appear on the stage to tell about something that has happened that has led to their death. 
and so it's a it's a beautiful form to think about in relation to staging the kind of um, uh, crisis of apocalypse in in relation to climate change, um, because we can talk about it as if it's already happened, <laughs> um, and this close reading of, of of a text is 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 a it's I mean it's very dramaturgical and it's the kind of dramaturgical work that one might do when one is working with a playwright. Ironically, um, you look at the 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 the, the the, the combination of the words and the structure of the words and the way that they resonate with other themes and the way that they give life to certain kinds of um, uh, imagination. And it's, it's what they give life to that then Chris takes into um, uh, typically, although not always, a nonverbal uh, presentation. And um, so, you know, there are, Chris's work is pretty much in maybe in three broad areas. There's the works that are object-based installation uh, arts that happen in gallery spaces. There's the works that have a, a strong emphasis on um, the, the materiality of the stage and the performance of objects and machines. And, um, and then, you know, he's done throughout his career, but more recently, a number of works that are in fact theatre, you know, most recently he's done a work that very much is is um, uh, working with the text of Beckett and the very famous actor, European actor, Johan Leysen, um, in a solo performance is, is, is working with that text as an actor. And that's an ongoing project um, where the actor is immersed in a space of, of things. And so it's, uh, it's a way of exploring the the kind of, you know, the darkness of Beckett, uh, but also the humor of Beckett. But the actor is is an environment, is in an environment where there is also other um, other transformations taking place. On, um, and so we we again watching this complexity, I think, of, mm -hmm. of things unfold. Um, his, you know, his something out of nothing, by contrast, was a piece that featured uncanny objects that would descend from the heavens and uh, almost like mutant triffid flowers would, would proliferate and open and very, very beautiful, but also very uh, dystopian. And meanwhile, there was a, a collection of um, dancers in perhaps non-human form with um, uh, very strange costumes and um, uh, uh, head headdresses that made them look somewhat plant-like or some like animal, you know, this is, uh, there's a vast range of interpretations of this. And then uh, uh, a celloist who provides the live soundtrack, which um, increasingly invades the sensorium of, of the audience to the point of uh, a, a kind of nightmarish experience. It, it's such an intense and unrelenting and um, uh, um, invasive uh, soundscape that, uh, that it, it literally transforms the body because your, your senses, your, you, you know, you're being given earplugs, but your body's kind of vibrating with the sound. It's, uh, it's terrifying. You know, we, we um, hope that this work, in a way, will come uh, to New mm, York one day. Mm. Um, a word that actually in lots of Siegel talks came up, by the way, uh, Christopher Dong also was here um, one day, uh, as was Okada and Ostermeyer from the Schaubühne. But um, you talk about slow dramaturgy. It's a word that we heard a lot, that we have to slow down, we're doing too much, that this mm. moment is slowing uh, down what we do, um, I think, and Bogart very clearly almost screamed in the time, yeah. slow the fuck down. She said, slow down. <laughs> so what yeah. is, what is, how, where does that idea of your slow dramaturgy you wrote about, where does that come in? Is that uh, something that's important the, 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 still or is it something I, that's past? No, I have to, well, it's something that I'm still working with. I acknowledge also my, um, my colleague, uh, an Australian uh, poet and academic Eddie Patterson, because uh, together uh, about a decade ago now, we wrote an essay called, you know, On Slow Dramaturgy. And 
I think it was the early days of, of my thinking and, and Eddie's thinking about this, um, uh, this, this presence of atmospheres uh, working on the stage and the, the, the breaking into the, 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 her, the hermetics of the text. Um, and it's also uh, drawing our attention to eco ecological or eco-critical theory. And so it's a term that I think is, is I'm, I'm us using this term very much to connect uh, thinking or dramaturgical thinking in, in theatre and performance to the wider question of uh, ecology and eco-critical practices. So this is something we look explored in the New Media Dramaturgy book where we were working with new materialism and the, the decentering of the human in the theatrical landscape. We see this in so many works now, Chris Verdonk, but also many uh, great makers uh, creating installation projects that have humans doing some things. Um, um, it's also, I think, a recognition of the way in which the temporality of theatre has changed. And, you know, if I reflect on the works that we made uh, in the 90s, for example, and in the early 2000s with MYID, not yet it's difficult, they were really intense, fast, physicalized, ex you know, extreme physical states, um, uh, kind of relentless, uh, kind of overwhelming. And um, that was a response, I think, to the decades, you know, of those times. Tadashi Suzuki inspired. Yeah, Tadashi Suzuki and, you know, um, uh, many artists were working in that way. Um, we, we don't, that, that work just would not sit well with our age where we, we need a much more contemplative, we need a, a much slower uh, um, a, a kind of sensibility in the theatre. And so I think the performance space has become much more like a visual art space, a, a space for the contemplation of ideas. And it's also something that needs to respond to um, uh, a much more um, diversely situated kind of politics, something that is more inclusive, something that is more, you know, in the in the vein of um, eco-critical thinkers um, uh, who who talk about the need to sit with the, the 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 environmental world and the need to sit with the experience of being with other people and the need to be less actively intervening and more perhaps responding to. So we see a lot of works now that are asking us to respond to rather than intervene in. Um, and, and slow dramaturgy, I think, is, is the way that I've tried to use, uh, I've tried to use that term to define that kind of work and that kind of strategy that artists are using in the theatre now. So a slow dramaturgy is one where we sit with rather than overwhelm. A slow dramaturgy is one where we are very attenuated to space and time. And very often we bring in um, experiences from you know, the quote unquote natural world into the, into the theater. So um, what Timothy Morton calls the dark ecology, you know, the, um, we, we bring sounds of water or we bring videoscapes of trees or, or uh, you know, spectacular kind of, not spectacular, anti-spectacular, but beautiful uh, meditations on on forces that are in in our world that are that are disappearing. Mm -hmm. So the you know work that I most recently worked on as a dramaturg um, with Alexis de Soup um, was actually a film work and an installation work that was based on the um, uh, documentation of the changing life of people in the Arctic Circle uh, with the melting of the ice and that you know there's huge impacts on people's lives, but also the 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 haunting of that space from from the cold war still and from you know the, the kind of radioactive uh, sites that are still bubbling away up there um, um, it's a very complex um, but ultimately very slow environment because it's freezing cold people move slowly the wind moves it moves hard but it's harsh but it's ships move slowly the landscape is kind of beautifully slow and vast, 
but at the same time, it's full of all of these tensions and undercurrents and 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 feelings of 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 of, um, of change, quite disturbing feelings. So, you know, so do you feel the ecological crisis the, in the eco criticism? Is that at the center? Is that what theatre should engage with? Is or and the idea of the class struggle, racism, or, uh, well, identity, and all that. What, and of course, there's lots about that. But from you, as uh, from your engagement, what do you think? Theatre has to engage uh, if it's that area that creates. I, well, uh, to me, the, the the question of the survival of the planet is the preeminent question of our time. Um, the the question of um, the 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 species extinction, the 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 necro capitalist plot that is project, which is you know um, destroying the very sustainability of the planet as we speak, is something that we need to, I think. Um, deal with in our work um, as as much as possible. I'm not suggesting that we um, only work on that theme. There are many many issues and very many many questions. And theatre should always be about questions. Um, the only thing I would say is that I reject a theatre that is without questions. I, re I I don't think that 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 is a worthwhile theatre at all. But a theatre that is dealing with 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 issues um, of of class disparity racism um is 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 valid but um um i think the new media kind of dramaturgy and the new dramaturgy that we're talking about here the way in which we're talking about this expanded understanding of what performance is is a way in which we can very meaningfully uh, engage with these questions um you know i'm struck by the way in which philosophers and, and uh, activists and, and people who write about climate are constantly saying, well, we need the arts. We need the arts to, to, to draw attention to this. We need the arts to imagine this because it, it, in some ways it's unimaginable. You know, yes, we can talk about the destruction of you know, the fact that um, so many species have become extinct in, in the last two decades. Um, but really, we we to really understand that i think we need to we, we need to think of different ways to to communicate or, or or show that kind of reality um yes we can you know that there's a great comment by a nuclear scientist who's talking in, in the aftermath of the nuclear meltdown at fukushima and he's on a panel where he's talking to artists and and scientists about uh, how to respond to the disaster. And he says, well, he, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, well, basically, um, I can tell you what happens in a nuclear meltdown, but actually that doesn't really explain what, you know, what the crisis is. For that, you need the imagination of artists um, because in technical terms, it's, it's quite clear, but, it's, but the, the mendacity, the extreme nature of that event is not communicated <laughs> enough. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's an important, very important aspect. And in some ways, so many of these other questions, of course, dovetail with this because, um, you know, we do have a, 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 a Western economic or not just Western, but a global economic uh, paradigm that is about the, the kind of intense exploitation of resources. And those resources include human resources. And within that, you have divisions of labor and you have class and you'll have exploitation of different classes and you have institutional racism and, and, and so many other things. So, you know, but, you know, we can't put everything in the, you know, we can't, you know, it's, in the 1980s, there was a trend to, you know, you could go to the bookshop and you have these books that were about this thick and they would be called something like, Einstein, Buddha, and Jesus, and they were trying to solve all, you know, there was this sort of unifying theory of everything. Uh, I kind of reject that notion. I don't think arts, arts are about specific things and particularities. Um, I'm very suspicious of the unification model. When you go to a New York theater, let's say you go to a New York theater workshop, La Mama, The Kitchen, uh, PS1, uh, with your background of Asian theater, European, cross European theater, what, what do you see? What do you think of the New York scene? Um, well, I'm probably going to get a bit into trouble here because, and you know, I came to the United States to work in the Graduate Center as a as a professor of Asian theater and dramaturgy. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm not proposing that I have any unique insight. 
Um, the first thing I noticed is that the actors here are fantastic. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm in awe at the level of, of the, the technical quality of, of actors. They, they can do anything and they can do it really quickly. And they, um, um, you know, I remember I was here for about, you know, I've been here for eight years now, so it's, it's not new, but quite soon after I arrived here, I went to see a work, a, a play reading or a workshop of a, a reading and, and the director got up and said, oh, well, we've only had a week to work on this. And so people might be on book. There wasn't a single actor on book. And, you know, you do these uh, play readings and these um, presentations of plays at the Seagull. And, you know, typically they get a day to work on them with a director and an actor. And the level of, of performance that they manage to um, uh, realize is, is phenomenal. They're really hard workers and they're really good at it. Um, I find that, that the, you know, there is, I've certainly seen some really great theater, New York based theater, but I must say I'm usually drawn to venues that are using, uh, bringing attention to theaters that have come from elsewhere, coming into New York. You know, the St. Anne's Warehouse, for example, has some really extraordinary programming. Um, I find directors often a risk averse here with, with few exceptions. Um, and partly that's to do with the, the kind of economic structures of theatre here. Um, um, but then, you know, there are a couple of people that I really think are exceptionally, you know, ex I think Richard Maxwell is a great visionary. Um, I think he's a, one of the great artists, playwrights of, of our time. Um, um, I saw, you know, this, the, I, I often appreciate the, the smaller work that, that doesn't get uh, so much attention, um, but you know a lot of it. I, it, to, I, I don't see some. I don't go to Broadway that much. Um, 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 I because I'm looking for theatre that is um, at the centre of some kind of debate for something, um, rather than just telling us something about who they are. Um, and, uh, you know, and a lot of New York theatres about that. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, it's, it's, we, could, we could shake things up a bit with, you know, there's a sort of way in which the older generation of great success in New York is still, you know, they, they, have, can, they have these spaces that they don't give up, that they don't let other people use, that they, so there's this way in which um, uh, we could, expect a little bit more attention given to the new generation, for example, um, than, than perhaps. Um, and um, they don't really teach performance dramaturgy in the United States, as far as I'm aware. They have really good literary dramaturgs. Um, but you know, if, if, if there could be some performance dramaturgy um, uh, as a viable um, way of working here well i think that would that would improve things somewhat yeah. like, like daniel fish right and daniel fish is you know i think he's his direction of oklahoma was just it was revelatory i mean to take a, a really you know kind of embarrassing work that is so overloaded with with problematic history and and turn it into that was just an extraordinary moment that's what happens when you have a director who makes an intelligent intervention um, his his production of uh, the Skirball of um, of Don DeLillo's um, un, um, Underworld, or um, am I remembering the title correctly? Um, um, also, incredibly brilliant. Um, but you know, where does Daniel work? He works mainly in Europe. You know, he he's, his work is not nearly as well supported as it should be. He should be running a major institution here. He should be given all of the support that he needs to make work because he is you know one of the few really outstanding directors i think of his generation uh currently working out of the united states mm -hmm. um, you can see i'm a big fan but um, yeah but yeah, it, put to market yeah mm, it is that level of uh of dramaturgical intelligence that he brings to the work that i find very compelling and what perhaps is not you know not 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 uh, so uh, present in many works where often also even well, it, based on a play the words are not as significant as they should be you know sometimes there's a 
is uh, something um, that, uh, uh, you know, with the dramaturgical thinking, a performance dramaturgy would be a better climbing of a mountain, you know, of an artistic work. And uh, one wonders why is it not part of everybody's um, um, toolbox? We're coming closer um, um, to the end. Um, and so uh, two questions. One would be, uh, you know, um, you also are a teacher, so you are kind of as young students, but also artists, but to the people who are listening now, who want to engage in dramaturgy, um, that time of Corona, what, what, what advice do you have for them? And then at the end, maybe what, what are you listening to? What are you reading? What, what's keeping your mood or warm? But first, you, what do you think? How should we use this time? And is, is it a time of change or not? Um. I don't know if it's a time of change. Um, I think it will be, things will change, yes. Um, but I don't know that there'll be any sense of us being in control of that. Um, I think that we're in a very reactive moment at the moment and we have to react with um, uh, our best abilities. So in, you know, for example, in working in a university which is dealing with this, we, we have to do our best to respond to an impossible situation where our students you know, have to attend class online where, um, and so in a sense, we have to bring our best game to that, even though it's not never gonna be good enough because the situation itself is overwhelming. Um, I don't know what's gonna to happen to theater and you know, I'm sure it'll return. Um, personally, you know, maybe that there'll be some, you know, some, something new that'll come and that will be good. But you know, the important thing also is that we, we don't lose the resources that we need to, um, to you know, maybe maybe rebuild is the wrong word because I, you know to to move forward to to create the, the kind of work that we need to create once we're through the coronavirus. Um, so we have to protect things in a certain kind of way, not in a conservative way, but you know there is a tendency for people to you know the dark forces to use the coronavirus to. Um, to introduce economic austerity or, you know, there's been a lot of uh, examples of theatre courses being cut from universities because they cost money or because, you know, there's a perception that they're no longer training people for the job market or, you know, we have to let's do our best to try and protect those kind of, um, uh, those, those things from, from this moment of, 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 risk of cuts. Um, I mean, the coronavirus is, you know, we, we also have to think about how, how do, you know, the situation we're in and, and how, how we got there, which is very much a, a kind of, it's an, it's an echo critical perspective. It's a perspective about um, the intensification of globalization. It's in the perspective about the, the, the mobility of bodies. It's a perspective around the, the kind of, a kind of strange lack of willingness to, you know, do something as simple as wear a mask. Um, um, we have to think about that and we have to theorize that and we have to identify what, what's wrong with that situation, I think, and, and make that much more explicit. Um, so there's, there has to be a certain kind of reckoning, I guess. Um, and the reckoning in artistic terms, I think, is, is, is going to be a good one. Um, um, what, what I think the, we, 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 we rely on our students to, 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 to continue to do the research that they do um, in order to, to make sense of, of, of this moment and to move forward into whatever comes next. Um, not out of a sense of this kind of inevitable progressive narrative, but in a sense of uh, critical reflection, um, intelligent thinking, and creative practice being the kind of components that we need to, um, to move from where we are now into something else. Um, you know, it won't be a return, um, but, you know, it'll be something. Um, and... Um, there, there may there, there may be possibilities within that to to reflect more carefully about the mistakes that got us into this situation in the first place.
Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So to, to continue that research, whether that's autistic yeah. or at a university. Yeah. So what and what do you read now? What do you listen to? What is, is there something new, well, something that, that gave you insights? Uh, I've been listening to Idiot Prayer by Nick Cave and the bad, you know, Nick Cave alone at Alexandra Palace. It's a performance that he did in the middle of the summer where he, Alexandra Palace is a big palace in England somewhere and he installed a grand piano and in a vast empty space and he staged this initially as a concert, a pay by, you know, an online concert. Um, and uh, now he's just released the recording of it. And he takes several of his really iconic uh, songs from his um, uh, from his mid career period, from after you know uh, after the punk period and after the kind of uh, but into the ballads, you know, the kind of really heart wrenching ballads. And he he reimagines them on this CD or this um, streaming. Uh, platform um, and they're, they're very pure and they're very simple and uh, because it's just him and, and the piano and there's, there's no bad seeds. Um, uh, I watch David Lynch's weather reports on YouTube. I recommend them to everybody. The man is a genius. Um, um, the daily ones, yeah. The daily reports where he always um, introduces the weather in LA, which is you know, meaningless to us in New York, but um, but then he has a little sort of reflection on some usually kind of really awful 1960s pop song that he has obsessions for. Yeah, yeah. And in um, that with Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, and I've been reading a book by Sabu Kosho, who's a Japanese uh, uh, academic and critic, and, 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 uh, and it's called Radiation and Revolution. And it's a, it's a book that uh, reflects broadly on the history of activism in Japan the anti-nuclear activism that uh, um, that was revived after the Fukushima disaster, uh, it's probably its eventual closing down and the rise of the uh, kind of um, uh, techno-nuclear economic uh, uh, governance that that has you know evolved in Japan that you know against all best evidence insists on having nuclear power plants on on uh, fault on fault <laughs> um, you know um, on the the fault zones of uh, earthquake prone landscape in Japan yeah in, um, in, incredible to even think about it and why yeah. you know, they, you know, and and he is a you know he is somebody who's using you know he's a Deleuzean he's using kind of the theory of assemblage to describe what's happening here so it's very it's a very interesting and 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 important take on on um, trying to understand the the countervailing forces it's it's not it's an you know in some ways it's an optimistic book in some ways it's a very dark book so yeah I maybe think that... one day you make a performance work out of it of radiation <laughs> revolution yeah. to perform yeah. the knowledge and stuff that we do at the, at the grad center also in, in programs peter willis thank you so very much for sharing and of course we don't have enough time to go on the work of the Return to Rams and so many, many, many mm -hmm. other works uh, we should be talking about. But I think it gave us an insight into, into your thinking, your work. It's also a work in progress, as we show work in progress at Prelude Festival. This is a work in progress on your book. So really, thank you for sharing. Uh, and uh, we all can't wait uh, um, till it's done. I hope we will have a Thiegel evening about it. Thanks to HowlRound for, for hosting us again, uh, Thea and VJ. Andy from the Seagull, it's Thanksgiving week uh, next week, and it's good to really also to take that week into account to appreciate what we have to uh, not, but also think about what is missing and uh, how we can be part of a change we want to, to see. But uh, this reminder from Peter that theater is a place where complexity is exhibited, where you can participate and understand perhaps something that an agonistic will never will be solved, but with some kind of referee rules, it is a place where people come together in a good way. We discuss it, we understand life, and it's something really unique that theater can offer that perhaps the film and the editorial or a sculpture, you know, will we have a harder time or has a different place, but this is something that we need. And my guess is it will be so important once we come back and it will be um, 
a new approach. But the ideas that's coming out of that long history of dramaturgy that was so close to the very beginning of uh, you know, theater and the Enlightenment, um, this is perhaps something we all have to pay attention to, that it has to be dramaturgical thinking behind theater performance work, that it's an engagement with ideas, that it's thinking by doing. And when we see a play, we see actually so with kind of a thinking on a stage and it's an argument it invites us to participate and um, so uh, really thank you peter and thanks for everybody for listening i know how much now also is out there we're going to take a break uh, for for next week and then we're going to be back in the week uh, later so thank you for listening and uh, and i hope it was as inspiring and meaningful as it was for me to also hear that you know in the, in the spoken form so such a short time so peter thank you and uh, thank you and you very much your writing for the book is it behind you or you already did it this morning or are you going to start i i did some writing this morning so i have meetings this afternoon but um yeah still will good luck okay peter thank you so much thank you everybody bye bye okay